Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's keynote presentation, The Science of Biofilm Control with Antimicrobial Agents. I am Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. LabRoots.com is the leading scientific social networking site, and we are proud to bring you this interactive web seminar. For more information, visit us at LabRoots.com. Here's how this presentation works. We want to hear from you. Questions, comments, and even answers can be submitted via the green Q&A button at the lower left of your screen. We'll try to get to everyone, but if not, we'll make sure to follow up with you by email. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you can't hear or see this presentation properly, let us know by clicking on the support button at the top right or the Q&A button in the lower left. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Phil Stewart. Dr. Stewart is a professor of chemical and biological engineering at the Center for Biofilm Engineering at Montana State University. He received his BS degree in 1982 from Rice University and MS in 1985 and PhD in 1988 from Stanford University, all in chemical engineering. After finishing his doctoral studies, he was a NATO postdoctoral fellow at the Institut Jacques Monod in Paris, France, and a senior chemical engineer at Bechtel Environmental in San Francisco, California. He joined the Faculty of Chemical Engineering at Montana State in 1991. Dr. Stewart has also been integrally involved with the Center for Biofilm Engineering since his arrival on the Montana State campus, serving as director from 2005 to 2015. Dr. Stewart's research focuses on the control of detrimental microbial biofilms. He has authored or co-authored more than 150 technical publications and has directed projects for 18 industrial sponsors. He is the recipient of an NSF Career Award and has been honored at Montana State University with both of that institution's top faculty awards for excellence in research and scholarship. I will now turn it over to Dr. Stewart. Thank you, Judy. Um, and this is Phil Stewart at the Center for Biofilm Engineering. It's my pleasure to have this opportunity to visit with you about microbial biofilms uh, and their control with antimicrobial agents. I'm um, going to take a science-based look at the the physics, chemistry, and biology of the interaction of a biocide or an antibiotic with a biofilm today. I just um, realized that there's an error on my title slide. It should say former director, Center for Biofilm Engineering. I've just stepped out of that role after 10 years as director here. We have a new director, Matthew Fields, who's uh, uh, leading the center now as of July 1st. I'm back to being a professor and, and researcher and teacher, just down the hall, still involved in the center uh, with the people here that I uh, enjoy working with. So just uh, to warm up here, I'd like to uh, show you pictures of a couple of biofilms to um, remind us of what they're made of. This is, if you're out for a little hike uh, this summer and cross a stream and slip on a slimy rock, that might have been a biofilm like this one. Uh, probably a mixture of bacteria and microalgae growing together on a, on a, um, in a symbiotic relationship on that rock. Um, and I know we're not going to be trying to uh, clean rocks uh, with antimicrobials, uh, but uh, I just want to put this up to remind us all that biofilm formation is a, is a ubiquitous natural process. It's not something that's been cooked up. Uh, just to deal with uh, troubles in industrial or medical systems. This is an ancient, uh, very robust uh, microbial survival strategy in, in natural environments. Here's a, here is a um, look inside a urinary catheter, and that deposit that you see in the lumen of the catheter is a mixture of bacteria extracellular polymeric substances that the microbes have secreted, the, the glue of the, um, uh, of the biofilm. And this also um, contains a mineral phase. So the microbial activity here facilitates the precipitation of a mineral called struvite. And 
the biofilm um, then essentially has little rocks in it. The urologists call this uh, um, deposit an encrustation, and it be can become so extensive that it uh, occludes the, the catheter, prevents it from performing its basic plumbing function of draining urine, and can sometimes then trigger a urinary tract infection. Like other device-related infections, uh, these respond uh, very uh, poorly to antimicrobial chemotherapy. Once they're set up, these biofilms are very difficult to eradicate. And here's a cutaway view of an oil field pipeline. Um, that crusty deposit that you see on the inside of this pipe is, again, a mixture of biofilm and corrosion products, uh, again, um, uh, abiotic materials that have become trapped in the sticky matrix of the biofilm. They use a lot of biocides in the oil patch to control problems associated with fouling, corrosion, uh, souring, the generation of hydrogen sulfide, and they're all microbial biofilm phenomena. So just a few examples. And um, to set the stage for the uh, discussion here, I have uh, just want to share with you a recently published um, uh, data from a, a literature review that I've done. And what I've what I've done here is to go to the literature and pull out um, numbers from in vitro laboratory investigations of biofilm susceptibility. And these are from a very wide variety of model systems that you know represent systems all the way from cooling water to dental plaque, different kinds of uh, microorganisms different kinds of biocides. But the design that you're, that you're seeing, the, the data that you're seeing here is all from the same experimental design. So the idea is that investigators set up some sort of biofilm reactor and grow the biofilm to different stages or ages, maybe a day, three days, a week. At each um, time point uh, that they looked at, they, they challenged the biofilm with the same antimicrobial dose and, and, and then um, measure the killing that is achieved in the biofilm, and that's that's what the log reduction is on the y-axis here. And what you see in all of these studies is the same trend: that as a biofilm ages, it becomes less susceptible to antimicrobial um, uh, control. We can even attach a um, half-life to this uh, uh, acquisition of tolerance. It, it happens um, over a time scale of a few days. And so um, this is just a, a backdrop to uh, trying to delve now a little deeper into uh, why biofilms are hard to kill and, and what um, phenomena are important in this interaction between an antimicrobial and uh, the microbes in a biofilm. So um, these are the four topics that I want to touch on. Um, diffusion is going to be important in the penetration of an antimicrobial agent into a biofilm. <clears throat> the flow of water around the biofilm and the mechanics of the biofilm itself are important in the process of biofilm removal, uh, a key and still rather poorly understood uh, aspect of biofilm control. And then we have the biology, ranging from the whole cell physiology, kind of where things are growing and where they're not growing, all the way down to the genetic level. And we're starting to see in the literature um, uh, some of the uh, clues about which genes and sets of genes are important in protecting a biofilm from antimicrobials. So we'll take a look at that, too. Let's start first with this question of um, diffusion and penetration. This is the most intuitive explanation for why a biofilm is hard to kill, that the, um, the drug or the disinfectant just doesn't get in. And what I'd like to do here is show you a movie um, made in the lab of a, an antibiotic working its way into a, um, a big staph biofilm. So this is a flow cell system, continuous system, in which the biofilm grows in a little glass tube that has a square cross section. <clears throat> and we can bring a microscope objective down to the top wall of that tube 
and using confocal scanning laser microscopy, look right inside the biofilm that's growing in there. Here's an example of what a Staphylococcus epidermidis biofilm can look like in this system. This is a uh, relatively low magnification uh, transmission image. Um, here the, the tube is about a millimeter across. The black blotches are large, dense clusters of staph biofilm hanging off the ceiling or sidewall of the tube. If we go inside one of those clusters at much higher magnification here by transmission electron microscopy, now you can actually see the individual staph cells, these little black spheroids, and this faintly stained grayish material in between the cells. Again, that's the uh, gel-like extracellular um, matrix that is the glue holding the structure together. So here's um, Here's daptomycin. This is the antibiotic we're going to look at. It's manufactured by Cubis Pharmaceuticals. And the chemist at Cubis attached a green fluorophore to it so that we can see it in the uh, confocal microscope. The structure of the molecule is not particularly important except to register this is a rather large antibiotic and a bit sticky. OK, so here's how the experiment works. We find a cluster like this one, and switch to the uh, green fluorescent channel. It's dark to start with um, because we haven't put the drug in, so there's nothing to see here. But the cluster is um, still there. It's right about there. And in a moment when we play the video, um, what you're going to see, it's uh, a six-minute time-lapse sequence under flowing conditions. Flow is from left to right, so the daptomycin which is going to appear green here, is going to come in from the left, surround this cell cluster, and move uh, right into the center of it in, um, in a matter of just a few minutes. All right? You're going to see it move in on the upstream and downstream edges of the cluster uh, symmetrically. And that's telling us that this is really, once we're inside the biofilm, it's really a diffusion process. So uh, now we'll play that video and watch this experiment. OK, so the take home message from this um, experiment is that this large um, antibiotic has uh, accessed the interior of this giant staph biofilm cluster in a matter of a few minutes. And certainly in the context of antibiotic chemotherapy, where we're measuring the duration in, in days, this delay of a couple minutes can't help us understand why this biofilm is hard to kill. The drug gets in. Let's look at another um, technique for measuring penetration. This one uses microelectrodes, very fine needle-shaped sensors that uh, are engineered to detect a particular chemical species. In this case, it's going to be hydrogen peroxide. And in this experiment that we're, I'll show you, we're going to actually have two electrodes. One is positioned down at the base of the biofilm, just a few microns off the stainless steel slide that it's attached to, and we leave it there. The second one is positioned up in the bulk fluid that's flowing over the biofilm. And and it's fixed. So now, when we run the hydrogen peroxide solution into this open-topped flow cell, we can record in real time what's being delivered to the top of the biofilm and what's making it down to the bottom of the biofilm. Here's an example of that. This is hydrogen peroxide concentration uh, versus time. The red trace is the signal from the electrode up in the bulk fluid. So at time zero, we run in a solution of nominally 50 millimolar hydrogen peroxide. And the black trace that's skidding along the x-axis is the signal from this lower electrode down at the bottom of the biofilm. Um, in other words, the hydrogen peroxide is not showing up down at the base of the biofilm. At uh, about 3,200 seconds in this experiment, we pulled that lower electrode back up into the fluid just to make sure it's working. We get a spike in signal. The electrode is working. The hydrogen peroxide is not penetrating. Um, 
Well, how can that be? I just finished telling you that daptomycin molecular weight 1600 penetrate, penetrates a monster staph biofilm in a matter of a few minutes, and now I'm telling you that hydrogen peroxide molecular weight 34 fails to penetrate, um, this is actually a little bit thinner biofilm, in the better part of an hour. And the explanation is, is that these bacteria, this happens to be uh, a pseudomonad, but like many, many other microbes, these bacteria make enzymes, catalases, that degrade and completely neutralize hydrogen peroxide. The biofilm is like a reactive sponge. It's soaking up hydrogen peroxide out in the surface layers of the biofilm faster than it can diffuse in. So um, this reaction diffusion interaction only happens when there's a when there's a rapid enough reaction uh, to set this up you know, with daptomycin, there's no such um, speedy uh, neutralization of the drug. And so it, it moves into the biofilm just according to the, the dictates of thickening diffusion. But when we have a neutralizing reaction, fast neutralizing reaction um, in the system, as we do for hydrogen peroxide, as we do for halogens perhaps, this is a very powerful protective mechanism. And I'm not trying to um, turn your stomachs with these equations, but I do want you to register that there's a rigorous physical chemical basis. It's a classic chemical engineering problem to analyze the penetration of a, of a reacting solute into a biofilm. OK, let's take a look at uh, the biofilm and the flow around it and how that um, can lead to biofilm removal. And um, unfortunately, the video that uh, goes with this slide um, is not um, working. So I'll just describe for you um, 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 the upshot here. Uh, this is actually not our work. This comes from a beautiful German website called the Virtual Album of Fluid Motion. And if you want to see some cool videos of uh, computational fluid dynamics, uh, this is the place to go. And what they simulated in this case is the flow down a conduit that has uh, rigid bumps on the wall. So the little black um, protrusions into the flow field, uh, the blue here, um, are, are bumps that, and I, what I liked about this is that this looks something like the capillary system that we just looked at where these, where these bumps would actually be for me, bio, uh, clusters of biofilm. And when you, when you look at the simulation, what you see visually is very uh, complex flow patterns. The flow is swirling around these bumps. There's recirculations. There's instabilities. And it's immediately clear that the fluid is applying forces to these bumps that, if, they're, if they were a biofilm, would it, could cause them to, to move or, or, or even uh, break. And we don't get to see that most of the time. The water is clear, and we don't appreciate just how much is going on in that fluid phase. Um, here's another way that we can um, watch this uh, interaction between the flow and the biofilm. We're back in the capillary flow cell that we've been looking at with a little di different staining technique. So here, what we're going to do is load the bacterial cells up with a green fluorescent dye. Um, prior to the antimicrobial treatment. The dye is trapped inside the cell as long as the cell membrane is intact. But if the antimicrobial damages the membrane, makes it leaky, then we can see that in the loss of green color. Right? So if the green color leaks out, we know the antimicrobial has uh, arrived and actually damaged the membrane. Here's an illustration. This is a very heavily fouled section of one of these capillary tubes. Uh, what you're looking at is an overlay of the um, transmission image in grayscale showing you where there's biomass, that's the black, and then a much thinner confocal slice showing you where the bacteria have been loaded up with this green dye. And now we're going to run in a quaternary ammonium compound, very common industrial biocide and consumer product disinfectant. This is an hour-long exposure. Um, under continuous flow, flow is from left to right. And what you'll see here when this movie is played is a very distinct um, spatiotemporal pattern of green fluorescence loss. 
look for the biofilm um, wiggling around in the flow. This is a nice reminder that these are rubbery, viscoelastic structures. And um, I think we'll watch this experiment now and play that video for you. Okay, it looks like uh, that didn't play very well, but uh, what you would have seen here is a fair bit of the green color leak out and um, the biofilm moving around, uh, but remaining intact. In fact, it looks like the quad doesn't remove a single cell. The whole structure is still there after the biocide treatment. and. Uh, that is, uh, you know, a very important distinction for us. That the that the process of uh, killing or disinfection and removal or detachment are distinct. They have different physics, chemistry, biology, different time scales. They're both important in a biofilm control um, a problem, but uh, at this point, we still know a lot less about. At removal than we do about uh, disinfection. Let's look at another um, example here, same system. Now we're coming in with a very aggressive concentration of free chlorine, 50 milligrams per liter, neutral pH, so a mixture of hypochlorous acid and hypochlorite. Uh, if this video will play for us, what you're going to see here is a progressive loss of green color that happens from the outside in. And I'd ask you to watch for um, the process here, what it looks like is that the chlorine only knocks out the green color in a thin zone around the periphery of the cell cluster, but it does kind of burn its way in. The other thing that you'll see here is some erosion of biomass, and we, th there's very few treatments that actually give us this, but what it looks like again is that the chlorine is attacking the mechanical integrity of the matrix around the edges of the cluster, weakening it, and then allowing the flow to strip that weakened material off, and so this cluster shrinks during the hour-long treatment. And let's let's see if this movie will uh, uh, run for us now. Okay. I have I think you got a glimpse of that, I hope. Uh, you could tell that the cluster shrank, that there's still a little green left in the center of it at the end of the time. What it looks like here is that the chlorine doesn't penetrate very well, and we've done a lot of work on that one. It's the exact same reaction diffusion uh, limitation of penetration that we saw with hydrogen peroxide. But on the other hand, chlorine does have a removal effect. It does actually weaken the material and allow some of it to be removed. Here's a completely different uh, flow cell and, and a different imaging um, modality. This is a staph, a different strain of staph that contains a green fluorescent protein. Um, and in this um, view, we're looking down onto the biofilm from above. Imagine that you're tethered in the, in the fluid over the biofilm, and we're using the confocal to take a stack of images and kind of reconstruct a 3D view of this. So, um, in this experiment, we're going to run a solution of sodium bicarbonate, baking soda, into the flow cell. And um, this is, we don't think this is a, uh, has antimicrobial properties. We don't think it kills bacteria, but you will see a dramatic effect on the biofilm. So when this movie plays, um, you'll see the biofilm kind of twitching around in the flow. And then partway in, when the bicarbonate actually hits the biofilm, it uh, very swiftly weakens this material and you'll see it uh, deform and uh, be stripped off the surface by the prevailing fluid flow. So we're not changing the flow rate here. The, the hydrodynamics stay the same, uh, but there's something um, changing in the, the strength of the biofilm. Um, 
by this uh, rather innocuous sounding treatment. And let's take a look at this experiment. Great. Um, I want to emphasize that uh, baking soda is not a magic uh, solution to every biofilm problem. There's other biofilms that are, are completely unperturbed by sodium bicarbonate. There's what we think is that there's something in this particular strain of staph aureus, uh, something in the matrix that's hydrolyzed by the uh, modest uh, pH increase, uh, and as that um, you know, material breaks down, the biofilm is weakened, and the, and the fluid flow is able to just uh, strip that right off the surface. Um, this just intended to open the door to thinking about alternative paths to biofilm control that don't have to rely just on killing germs. We can now target the matrix of the biofilm, and of course, down the road, it's attractive to uh, imagine combinations of these strategies uh, that might be synergistic. While we're thinking about biofilm um, material properties, I'd like to share with you some uh, work by uh, our collaborators Ray Hozalski and his postdoc, Shrijan, former postdoc, Shrijan Agarwal at the University of Minnesota. Um, what Shrijan did was to um, actually measure uh, a material property, the failure strength of uh, bacterial biofilm. And the biofilm here is the dark vertical stripe in the center of this image. It's uh, stuck to, it's grown on a coupon that's to the left. And then he came in with a curved micropipette and grabbed hold of the biofilm by suction. And once he had a hold of it, the coupon was retracted. So in, the, in this video, you're going to see the coupon and biofilm move to the left. And the biofilm gets uh, uh, an increasing uh, force applied to it and eventually will break. And from that video, um, he was, Sri John was able to extract an estimate of the uh, failure strength of the biofilm. So let's watch this um, experiment. This is probably just a 30, second, uh, 30 seconds in real time. So here's the video. So I think you can appreciate from that just how remarkably elastic this particular biofilm is and uh, how um, uh, it's hard to get it off the surface in this case. Um, here's a look in the, at some composite measurements from the, that kind of system. This happens to be for Pseudomonas aeruginosa. This is a histogram of the failure strength on the, on the x-axis plotted on a log scale. Um, and um, what I want you to get, the failure strength is in Pascal, units of Pascal, so newtons per meter squared, force per area, per cross-sectional area. What I want you to see here is that this property spans two, almost three orders of magnitude. In other words, sometimes when Sri John comes down and, and grabs hold of the bathroom and pulls on it, uh, it falls off very easily. And other times uh, when he... Uh, uh, grabs hold of it, uh, this would be up at the right end of the plot here, it's extremely tenacious. You have to really apply a lot of force to get it to come off. And what I think this is a clue telling us that biofilm material properties, like other, like the chemical and biological properties of biofilms, can be very heterogeneous at the micro scale, a lot of variety. And that, that variety just is one of the ways that these systems are so robust. The biofilm really has it both ways here. The weakly attached pieces um, can release from the surface and go downstream, colonize new uh, locations. The uh, very uh, um, firmly attached pieces 
can uh, hold on and survive, uh, you know, huge uh, physical challenges, and they're going to be there tomorrow to, uh, you know, um, own that peat, that, that patch of uh, substratum. Okay, let's move into the biology and think about the physiology of the organisms within a biofilm. We've done a lot of work uh, developing and applying techniques to actually go inside a biofilm at the micro scale and visualize and quantify patterns of activity. And here's one example. This is a Pseudomonas aeruginosa biofilm, also in the capillary flow cell where we've used a uh, reporter gene trick to light up regions of active protein synthesis. Those are the green. The red is just a counter stain to show you where there's, where there's biomass, independent of its activity. And what we see is in the larger clusters that the protein synthetic activity localizes in a thin zone around the periphery of the cell cluster. Right? This, is, this is where the biofilm adjoins the medium, which is the source of nutrients and oxygen. So this, this makes sense. Um, but what we, what we would hypothesize here is that many of these red bacteria in the center of, the, of this cluster are still viable. They're just inactive. They just don't have everything they need to be um, rapidly synthesizing protein. And they're shut down. And in that uh, less active state, they're likely to be less susceptible to many different kinds of um, antimicrobial challenges. This is a recurrent theme in mature biofilm systems. Let me just show you um, a little bit more data to reinforce you know, the, what's going on here. Here's, uh, here's a measurement also made with a microelectrode. This one is a, detecting oxygen in which we're showing that within about 50 microns into the biofilm, most of the oxygen is gone. So there's a very steep chemical gradient here. Um, bacteria up at the top of the biofilm are respiring and consuming oxygen as it diffuses in. And this creates this sort of oxygen shadow underneath that, um, for one thing, can help us understand how a biofilm in an aerated water can harbor strict anaerobes, or how a biofilm um, is likely to exhibit uh, stratified um, activity patterns. There's regions of you know, very different oxygen concentration in this case. Here's another, another example. Uh, this is a Klebsiella biofilm, a frozen cross-section sliced through the biofilm. The substratum would have been down along the bottom here, nutrients uh, flowing over the top. And the the colors here, without going into the details of the method, reveal the uh, relative growth rate of the cells. So red or orange-red cells are growing rapidly. And yellow or green uh, regions indicate uh, putative regions of slow or no growth. And so what you see here is a band of activity that tracks the biofilm nutrient interface where the biofilm is thin and not too dense um, in between these first and second clusters, for example, the whole biofilm can be active. But in the three thicker spots underneath, we have these regions where we um, uh, speculate that the, the bacteria are uh, growing slowly or actually have stopped growing. And this is, you can see this is an old result. What we're doing now with mathematician uh, Tian Yu Zhang is to um, simulate this. And again, it's a reaction diffusion interaction. Uh, now we're not dealing with an antimicrobial. We're dealing with the growth limiting nutrient, which in this case is glucose. And the colorful pattern here is one of the simulations um, showing you the predicted distribution of glucose. Uh, glucose is being delivered along that top boundary. Uh, red corresponding to higher concentrations, blue to lower concentrations. And here we are able to predict that, indeed, we anticipate regions of diminished or depleted glucose underneath these three cell clusters. And if we take that glucose concentration map and just plug it into a Mono growth kinetic expression for the growth of this organism, we can predict patterns of specific growth rate. That's what the top panel here is. This is the uh, simulated uh, 
growth rate in uh, units per hour, put on an orange-green scale so it matches the experimental result. And, and the take-home message here is that that we can um, we can do a pretty nice job of simulating these uh, patterns of activity that go from all the way from very rapidly growing cl close to the maximum specific growth rate of the, of the organism to essentially uh, zero growth rate. And again, it's these regions of green where the, the organism has slowed way down that are going to be difficult to target with an antibiotic, for example. OK. Uh, all right. Uh, let's uh, take this one uh, level or a couple levels further down all the way to thinking about specific genes that could be involved uh, in the um, protection of the biofilm. And I'd like to start with uh, a little explanation of the persister hypothesis and a uh, simulation, again, using a model. This is one of the tools that, that we use here at the Center for Biofilm Engineering uh, quite a bit. Uh, the model will be a 3D cellular automata um, uh, model of biofilm accumulation that captures this uh, mechanism of persister formation. So here's how that works. Um, the idea is that most of the bacteria in the biofilm are in this green state on the left where they're growing, they're synthesizing the matrix of the biofilm as long as there's nutrients available locally, and they're propagating the genome. These cells are also relatively uh, vulnerable to an antimicrobial challenge. Every once in a while, one of these green cells differentiates through the expression of specific genes and gene products that we're not going to try to name right now, into a protected persister cell, which we color purple here. These are likely also a non-growing state, but these cells are uh, highly protected from antimicrobial challenge. They can survive the challenge, and then if, as long as they can you know, kind of revert or resuscitate, they can reseed the community after that um, challenge. All right, let's look at this simulation. Here you're looking at a patch of substratum in gray that uh, is randomly colonized initially with 28 little microcolonies of biofilm. And uh, when we watch this uh, video, you'll see these little clusters begin to grow and expand, and they start to coalesce. If you put your nose up to the screen, you might be able to see um, a purple dot here and there. So what we've done is to code in a random probability at every time step that a green cell will convert into a persister state. And those become, those are colored purple. And there's, likewise, there's a random probability that the persister will uh, revert back to a growing uh, green state. Uh, and we've picked those two probabilities so that at any time, about 1% of the population is in the persister state. So you, you'll see the purple dots come and go. They're ephemeral, but there's always a few around. And when the antimicrobial treatment comes in at 200 hours in this simulation, it's going to kill most of the green cells. And they turn red when they die. Any cell turns red when it dies. The, the antimicrobial is only in there for 12 hours. And what happens post-treatment um, is that the persisters uh, kind of germinate and reseed little clonal pockets of regrowth. And very quickly, this whole biofilm regrows. Uh, you're also going to see towards the end a big sloughing event where a raft of biofilm comes off, but there'll be a little bit of life left in the uh, chunk of biofilm that's still attached. So let's watch this uh, simulation in the video that's um, next. OK, so this is a simulation that doesn't prove anything, but it does tell us that if this division of labor strategy of putting a, 
uh, a subpopulation into a protected state actually happens in, in real biofilms and in microorganisms, it's a, it is indeed a very powerful protective mechanism. It can help us understand why these systems tend to, uh, whether in industrial or medical, tend to regrow pretty quickly uh, after a, um, an antimicrobial treatment. Um, I'm going to finish by showing you a little bit of uh, work from our own lab on uh, trying to get a handle on which genes are involved in the protection of a biofilm. This, is, uh, uh, this biofilm was grown in the drip flow reactor that you see here. And we can show this is going to be a pseudomonas, three-day-old pseudomonas aeruginosa biofilm. Like the other biofilms that uh, we investigate, we see stratified activity here, regions of uh, you know, activity and inactivity. The oxygen profile that we saw a few slides ago is from this same system, so we know there's an oxygen gradient in this biofilm. And uh, what we've done here is to um, harvest First, let me um, just show you that indeed these biofilms are less susceptible than free-floating bacteria. So uh, these are um, kill assays. This is a log reduction on the on the y-axis, measure of killing, uh, comparing planktonic and biofilm cultures of the same strain of Pseudomonas to two different antibiotics. Uh, so with with um, the intact biofilm, the red bars, we get about a log reduction with this 12-hour exposure. Whereas uh, the planktonic cells, we get about something like a four log reduction. If we uh, take a biofilm prior to antibiotic treatment and, and break it apart, disperse it, and, and, and resuspend the cells, and then add the antibiotic, th those cells are, uh, are, are susceptible to the, to the agent. So um, this is a reversible, probably a reversible phenotypic um, uh, mechanism here. All right, and what we've done then is to harvest messenger RNA from the biofilm. Uh, so we're in the middle here and compare biofilm to planktonic gene expression patterns using microarrays. And today I'm just going to focus on the 340 genes that we see that are um, more um, highly expressed in the biofilm compared to planktonic. They give us a clue about what the, the biofilm is doing that's different from a suspended cell. 340 is, is something like 5% uh, you know, of, the, of the genes in the organism. And I'm not going to go through all 340 <laughs> genes with you. Um, what we're going to do, oh, well, this is, this. you could call this a fishing expedition, but um, the great thing about microarrays is you know, we are going to catch some fish, and by um, kind of examining which fish we catch, we we do learn something. Okay, um, the strategy we've taken here to um, analyzing that that list of 340 genes is to go to the literature and compile independent lists of genes that are associated with particular protective mechanisms. For example, the first line here refers to drug efflux pumps, a very common, uh, important mechanism of antibiotic resistance. Uh, these are, these are you know, pumps in the cell membrane that actually spit or vomit the, the drug out of the cell. And what we can do now is, is ask, by comparing this list of drug efflux pump genes with our 340 genes that are up in the biofilm, are those genes already turned on in a biofilm, um, even before the antibiotic got there. And we just, we're just looking for overlap between the two lists of genes. And we can do a statistical test to um, convince ourselves that the overlap is you know, more than just chance. When we do that for the drug efflux pump genes, the 39 genes there, there's very little overlap. The large p-value here is telling us that you know, we didn't really catch anything on that uh, um, mechanism. Uh, same thing here for iron limitation. We don't see any signature for iron limitation in this particular biofilm, neither for heat shock, neither for genes that have been uh, um, associated with ciprofloxacin sensitivity in planktonic cells. 
we do see a few of the genes associated with homocerine lactone quorum sensing. Uh, but what, what is overwhelmingly um, convincing is that there's large overlap between our 340 biofilm expressed genes and genes associated with oxygen limitation and with uh, stationary phase or, or growth arrest. So um, actually, this is, this is very um, gratifying to me. I, I already told you that we measured a chemical uh, gradient in oxygen. So we, we know oxygen is limiting in part of this biofilm. And here from the transcriptome, the bacteria are telling us that indeed, you know, we're asphyxiating down here. We can't get enough oxygen. We can, we can infer that from the genes that they've induced. Likewise, we see genes associated with uh, slowdown and growth and uh, entry into a kind of uh, a limited or non-growing state. So the next step here, which I'm uh, racing through, um, but uh, is to take uh, mutants in genes, regulatory genes associated with this, either the hypoxia response or the stationary phase growth arrest response, grow a biofilm with that mutant strain and ask if it is more susceptible than the wild type. So here's here's that data. This is for this is for ciprofloxacin. So with the wild type strain, the first line here, the first row, uh, we get just a little less than a, than a one log reduction with our standard cipro treatment. And if we take an ANR mutant, so this is a mutant deficient in the response to hypoxia to low oxygen. Uh, that mutant forms a, still forms a biofilm, uh, but the biofilm actually is more susceptible to the drug treatment. So we get now a two and a half log reduction, and we get the we we see the same behavior with an RPOS mutant. RPOS is a stationary phase sigma factor, again a regulatory gene that's uh, that, that comes into play when the bacteria uh, exit exponential growth and and enter stationary phase, and these uh, RPOS mutants form a form a great biofilm that's actually a little thicker than the wild type biofilm that is quite a bit more susceptible, almost a three log reduction on the RPOS mutant. And similarly, uh, this relase T double mutant is a mutant deficient in the stringent response, another mechanism by which bacteria deal with growth arrest. Uh, and again, that mutant is also uh, less susceptible to, to uh, I'm sorry, more susceptible uh, than the wild type. Um, just to show you that not every mutant <laughs> we uh, try uh, falls over dead here. Here's another one, the MVFR. We see that a lot of genes regulated by MVFR in the biofilm, but the mutant is actually not statistically significantly more susceptible than the wild type. So in this case, what it, what it looks like is that there are parallel, o possibly overlapping stress responses, of, and there may be more than these three in the middle that I'm, I've talked about here, that do contribute uh, to the protection of this biofilm from ciprofloxacin. Here's the results for tobramycin. And um, interestingly, none of these mutants have a phenotype for tobramycin. So it doesn't seem to matter what genes are on or off for tobramycin. It's still hard to kill. And so I think we think there's a different protective mechanism at work for tobramycin um, or contributing to tobramycin protection. We could talk about that uh, more. All right. Um, just to recap, here are the four phenomena that we've uh, talked about that are involved in the interaction of an antimicrobial agent with the biofilm. And uh, a summary of the, of the take home points here first, that the penetration of um, a biocide or an antibiotic into a biofilm, actually, for that matter, any, any solute into a biofilm, is governed by a reaction diffusion interaction. Uh, it's for those um, antimicrobials that are subject to a rapid neutralizing reaction that we can see a breakdown in penetration. Also, I told you that removal is distinct from killing and that the mechanics and uh, flow of fluid around the biofilm matter in the removal process. 
We know that biofilms are crisscrossed by concentration gradients in metabolic substrates and products. And for this reason, biofilms harbor uh, amazing physiological heterogeneity. Uh, in the same uh, small uh, you know, space, we can have bacteria uh, rapidly growing and then not too far away, ones that are uh, dormant. And we're beginning to see uh, in the literature um, uh, clues about the specific genes and pathways that are important in, uh, or that contribute to the protection of a biofilm. And uh, what it looks like to, to me at this point is that there are uh, multiple uh, different stress responses and possibly uh, pathways of differentiation into a persister state that can, um, can contribute to uh, reduced biofilm tolerance. Thank you so much for your attention. And um, if you'd like to learn more about biofilms, I invite you to find the website for the Center for Biofilm Engineering or come up to Montana and visit us sometime. There's a lot of blue sky and puffy bacteria-shaped clouds sailing overhead. Uh, thank you. And I think we move now to the question and answer uh, session. Thank you for that presentation, Dr. Stewart. Yes, we want to get right to your questions and input, so here's a reminder how to let us know what you have to say. Questions, et cetera, can be submitted via the Q&A button at the lower left. We will try to get to all of you, but if not, we will be sure to follow up after the broadcast. Our first question is from Cal from the University of Pittsburgh, who asks, what method do you use to successfully extract high-quality RNA from biofilm? Uh, okay, um, you're, I, you're asking the engineer about the um, biology question. So this is this is a collaboration with uh, Mike Franklin in our microbiology department here, who could give you a much better answer. So I can't, off the top of, of my head, even uh, tell you the specifics of the method. The work that I just um, mentioned to you has been uh, recently published in Antimicrobial Agents and Chemotherapy. Um, but this is actually fairly routine now, so <clears throat> um, um, lots of people are able to extract uh, good quality RNA from biofilms and, and, and induce, uh, you know, RNA-seq or microarrays. Okay. Hugo from Aptar Estonia asks, can horizontal transfer of antibiotic-resistant genes be assessed in biofilms? Um, Certainly, it it can be, and people have done that. And um, today, I'm really talk you know, I was talking more about tolerance rather than than resistance. But it's clear that um, you know a plasmid that has a, a resistance gene on it can move from one cell to another in a biofilm. And there's been some elegant demonstrations of that um, using, for example, um, a green or, or you know a fluorescent protein marker. Uh, that moves from one cell to another, and, and you can actually see that uh, transfer, you know, in the, in the new cell lights up when it can, uh, uh, acquires that plasmid. So certainly, a horizontal gene transfer does, can happen in a biofilm. Lots of great questions coming in. We have time for just one more. It is from Miranda from the University of Perugia. And she asks, I'm wondering if antimicrobial agents targeting the biofilm matrix, although being efficacious in eradicating the biofilm itself, could be harmful in terms of favoring the detachment of live bacteria from the biofilm and their migration to other sites where they can, in turn, form against biofilm. Uh, excellent question and absolutely something that we need to, to pay attention to. So the, the issue here is that if we pour an agent into a system, whether it's a cooling water system or a, um, a somebody's bloodstream, that causes a massive dispersal or detachment event, um, that could, could cause problems downstream. Certainly releasing a burst of bacteria into the bloodstream, viable bacteria might not be a good thing at all. So I think in many of these situations, it will be important to have an antibiotic or another antimicrobial uh, in, the, in the mix to be able to control those released bacteria, the released microorganisms. And um, 
that you know the good news is is that we know when 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 the bacteria become dispersed and planktonic that they're they're going to be much easier to control. I also think that there may be scenarios where dispersing the bacteria um, we won't have to do anything else. For example, in the body, the body's own defenses will just mop up those and and uh, uh, dispatch those uh, dispersed to planktonic cells, and and the problem will be solved. Okay, we we do have time for another one for you. Um, Christopher from Utah Division of Wildlife Resources Fisheries, um, let's see, Experiment Station asks, what effect do antiquorum sensing agents have on a mature biofilm? Uh, so there's been a huge interest in um, this potential strategy of jamming the cell-cell communication process in in a biofilm as a way of an alternative st uh, strategy for um, you know, controlling it. And uh, well, despite years of work by really smart people, there's, we haven't seen any of those quorum sensing inhibitors commercialized. So um, this is another one where it looks like blocking quorum sensing on its own is probably not enough to uh, you know, just have a biofilm disappear. Uh, it may reduce blocking quorum sensing. Uh, there's some evidence that that can um, um, reduce or uh, uh, knock down the defenses of the biofilm and make it more susceptible to an antimicrobial challenge. Uh, but right now, um, I'm not seeing uh, you know quorum sensing blockers that uh, you know just cause a biofilm to go away on their own. There's there's more possibilities there. That we're just not we're not there yet. If if we weren't able to speak directly with you today, we'll be sure to follow up with you. Thank you for taking part. We want to thank today's presenter as well for joining us here at LabRoots.com, the leading scientific social networking site. For more information, visit us at www.labroots.com. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing on our website through February 2016. We will let you know when it's been posted, and we hope you pass that information on to any colleagues who couldn't take part in today's broadcast. See you next time. Goodbye.